Hello and welcome to episode 66 of The Thing About Golf, Golf Australia Magazine's eternal search to uncover the multitude of reasons that people get hooked by and on this absurd game. My name's Rod Murray, and if you're joining us for the first time, I have to say that you've picked quite the episode to start. There was a time in 2007 when the numbers said there were just 15 humans on planet Earth who were better at the game of golf than Nick O'Hearn. That's quite the achievement for a player who 13 years earlier turned professional off a handicap of four, and who once shot three straight rounds in the 80s during a three-day pro-am. But Ahern is nothing if not determined, stubborn even, some might say. Despite a golf swing that prompted his coach to ask at their first lesson if O'Hearn was indeed a professional, the left-hander, against all sensible advice to the contrary, set his sights on a playing career. Alongside wife Alana, he mapped out a plan, and 30 years later, one would have to agree, it was a roaring success. Ahern wasn't a prolific winner, either at home or abroad, but he might be one of the most consistent golfers ever to leave these shores. Now a published author of two excellent books about the mental side of the game, Ahern has found a second career back in Melbourne, coaching. He works with everyone from elite tour players to double-digit handicappers, and his two books, Tour Mentality and the most recent, Play Your Best Golf, are a must-read for any golfer wanting to improve their scores. So, if you want to know how a former state baseballer carved out a career that included not one but two match play victories over the great Tiger Woods, keep listening because this is a fascinating chat with Nick O'Hearn. Nick O'Hearn, welcome to The Thing About Golf. Thank you for doing it. We know it's a commitment. Let's start right there with the title, the clues in the title. What's The Thing About Golf for Nick O'Hearn? You've been at it for a lifetime now. (laughs) I have been doing it for a while. The Thing About Golf, that's an interesting question. Um... There's probably a few things, to be honest. Uh, I love the individual nature of the game. I grew up playing a variety of team sports, basketball, soccer, baseball, and I'd always think to myself, gee, we played well, but uh, we lost. You know? <laughs> I had a oh, great sorry. game, but... <laughs> yeah, m- more so I played well and the team lost, should I say. So I kind of like the fact that golf is, it's all up to you. And, and in a way, you're almost, you're playing against yourself and you're playing against the golf course and the elements. Which is another side of the game I love, how it's on an ever-changing playing field, basically. You're, the golf course seems to evolve in front of you, and, and whether you play it even the same day or the next day, it can change through the weather, through pin positions, tee markers, things like that. I mean, St Andrews is the ultimate mm-hmm. test in that regard, how every time I've played it, I've, I've found a new way to almost figure out how to... <laughs> we figure out how to muck it up, we figure out how to master it, yes. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And and I think the other part about it is um, how I can just have a game or a match against anyone. Um, that's the beauty of the handicap system, no other sport you can do that in. So I guess you add all those things up and it's just such an intriguing sport. And uh, probably finally, I think, to summarize all those things is is uh i just find it's a an ever changing and ever evolving problem solving activity and that's what i love about it it's a journey not a destination golf isn't it in so many i suppose all sports are in some ways but i think golf is probably the ultimate sort of reflection of that isn't it how did you get started i think we'll i think we also i think your dad was a very good baseball player and you were quite a handy baseball player how did that sort of switch to golf for you I was probably a better baseball than I was as a, a golfer as a kid. <laughs> 16 in the world, Nick. You're a fairly good baseball player. I was, I was pretty young, though. Um, yeah, he, my dad was a very uh, well-renowned, respected baseball. He played state, played for Australia. I ended up playing state-level baseball, never golf, funnily enough. But Pitcher or better? I was a catcher and a pitcher. Okay. So I, I was more of a, a bunter and you know got on base pretty regularly. I wasn't the... I wasn't the home run hitter, so to speak. Not the flashy player. No, no. Very consistent. A bit, a bit like my golf. I was going to say, it <laughs> seems to be a theme developing here. Yeah, and, and he just started playing golf, um, and I th- sort of thought, oh, that, that looks pretty cool. I'll give that a try. So I was probably seven or eight when I first started, and, and I was actually quite quite good when I was 11, 12, 13. I was you know, winning a lot of those little Graham Marsh Junior Golf Foundation events that they had on in the school holidays. And then through I mean, my mid-teens, I, I struggled. Uh, towards my late teens and 
my brother was actually a very good golfer. He made the state team and was looking at potentially. Troy, I think he now runs the PGA division in Perth. He used to run the PGA. Now he's the general manager at the Mount Lily Golf Club oh, in oh, Perth, wow. where we where we all grew up playing. And my parents are still members. I'm I'm still a member there. Some so. Good pedigree there. Well, you might not be the best golfer there anymore. Well, not with anymore. Ha- with Hannah being uh, <laughs> Hannah Green being there. Hannah Green, and now we've got Kirsten Rudgley coming Brun- along, yeah. who's an outstanding player. And there's a couple of pros have joined uh, recently. I think Brent Brumford's a member okay. there now, and Scott Strange. So they'd make a heck of a pennant team at the moment, I'd say. <laughs> yes, indeed they would. <laughs> so I sort of followed in the family footsteps in a way. And as I said, Dad was very good. He still, to this day, plays off about an eight handicap, I think. So, And he's 80, so he's got to shoot his age wow. to play to wow. his handicap, which is impressive. One but day I hope to get there. It's another thing about golf, I guess, isn't it? He's probably not still playing baseball, but... No. But still playing golf, and well. It's a game for a lifetime, yeah. as you say. So I... You know, I followed followed whatever my brother did, and I always tried to just beat what Troy did, basically. You know, was, he was a baseballer, so I followed him, and I thought, I wonder if I could be better than him. And same happened in golf and tennis and the other sports, and, and that's where I fell in love with it. It's probably a small thing in some ways, Nick, but how important is that? I remember interviewing Stacey Peters once, and she had brothers, mm. and competing with her brothers ended up with her becoming a professional golfer, a touring golfer. How important is that in the development of all of those things if you're going to go on to a professional career. I suspect if we found lots of professional sports people, they would have siblings that they competed with. Interestingly enough, I thought I heard a study about it a while ago, and I've spoken to a number of other people in in different sports as well as golf, but they've said um, a lot of professional sports people are the youngest siblings. Mm. So they're always trying to beat the older sibling, and in my case, very much so. And if you ask a lot of, I think, professional golfers, footballers, you name it, a lot of them have older siblings that we're just trying to beat. So it almost builds up a a determination, a bit of a grit within someone to just be maybe better than what they really are because they're always just trying to beat someone. And that's a massive thing in, in professional sport. Yeah. You're not one who outwardly shows that. We see some golfers who outwardly show that competitive style, but you can't do what you did in the game without being competitive. Are you like that with everything? I've heard it said of Tiger Woods, he'd compete against you drinking a glass of water. Mm. He'd be determined to win. Are you that type, just not showing it on the outside? I'm, I'm a bit that way. <laughs> <laughs> I never like to lose, put it that way. So whether it's a, a game of tennis or a game of chess or, or whatever we're doing, even with my kids, you know, I'm always trying to beat them. Although in a, most of those those sorts of board games, they always usually kick, kick <laughs> my butt, but I'm pretty competitive. But it's funny, anything with a with a bat and a ball, I'm, I'm pretty handy at. So I've always been very competitive in that regard. Table tennis was one of those sports that I love to play and, okay. and I always found myself pretty good at because one of the things I could do is use both hands so that... Are you ambidextrous? A little bit in that way. Not not to the extent of, you know, I can't really throw a ball well left-handed, but I can hit a tennis ball okay left and um, table tennis in that regard because I'm actually one hand right hand. Right. So let's go back a bit. We know that you now putt right-handed. Mm. You've always played left-handed. I assumed that you were a left-hander. Why left-handed playing golf? Everything I've picked up with two hands, I've done left-handed. Right. So baseball, I'd bat left, okay. I'd throw right. Cricket, I'd Cricket, bat left, I'd bowl right. So... For some reason, that was the it way. It just felt natural. Yeah, felt and I think was... I must get it from my mum because she's a right-handed golfer, but she throws a ball left, right's left in that right. regard. So there must be some sort of genetic mix-up in there where I got the opposite. Were you of an era generation where left-handed was an issue for equipment? There was a time when that was the case for you. Yeah, early on. I mean, for sure, getting golf clubs that matched and things like that in, in good quality clubs early on. But uh, that was probably one of the beauty of growing up is the fact that I started out with a three five seven nine iron wedge driver putter. None of them matched. They all had different shafts, different groups, different heads. And you, I actually learned how to play the game that way because my five iron, I knew I could hit a certain way. But if I tried to put the same thing on the swing on the seven iron, it wouldn't come out how I wanted. So I'd have to manipulate that. So... In a way, it actually made me a better golfer as a kid growing up. And interestingly, when I went to the broomstick putter in my early 20s, it was really hard to find a left-handed one. And the only company that made them was Ping. Ping. They made the B90 in left hand. The other companies made it in right, but no one in left. So that's why I became basically a Ping player the rest of my career, because I loved the B90. And, and so you started up. with the putter and then the rest of the clubs yeah, exactly. just sort of followed. What was that like? It was a bit of a kid in a lolly shop moment, I imagine, at some point just after you turn pro, where you get a bag with your name on it, and suddenly the people who make clubs want to talk to you. And as you go through the process, it probably becomes quite passe at some <laughs> point. But can you recall that period of sort of 
getting good enough to turn professional and the sort of the feelings around that? You remember your first tournament? Yeah, I, I mean, I became a trainee professional. Uh, I turned pro when I was 19 and I was four handicap. So in that sense, you know, I wasn't turning pro to play the game. I, I wasn't good enough to play. So the lowest handicap I got down to was two when I was 16. And when I turned pro, I was off a four handicap. So. Did you want to be a oh, I wanted professional? To play. Right. Yeah, I always wanted to play. And after I finished school, I just thought, well, I want to be involved in golf. I know I can play this game, but I just, I'm just i not good enough right now, but I'm pretty sure I'll get good enough later on. But everyone who knows anything about the game, Nick, must have told you, either gently or directly, mm. sorry, son, you're 19 and you're off four. You're not going to make it. Oh, yeah. No, no one really believed the fact that I would maybe make a career out of this. The only people withstanding would be my wife, Alana, and, and my parents probably as well because they pointed me in the right direction with finding a coach, and then Alana helped me out in various other ways with a sports psychologist and things like that. So... Early on, it was interesting in the in the fact that I wasn't uh, a professional golfer in the fact that I played. I was actually a teaching pro. So when I finished my traineeship at 22, I was working in a shop in a public golf course called Caramar out, uh, out in the outskirts of Perth. And that's where I did my traineeship at Marangaroo as well as a combination of courses. And when I first became pro, it was... Yeah, I was just a teaching pro. Worked in the shop and, you know, served people and got them out on the golf course on a public sense. Uh, you know, did the five o'clock openings and closed the closed the gates at seven o'clock on some evenings as well. So, but I always had in my mind, I wanted to play the game for a living and, and then figuring out how to do that. That was the real interesting part a few years later. That's quite an unshakable self-belief. Mm. Everything in the world is telling you that that's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. What keeps you going through that? Did you have downtimes that, or did you just <laughs> always assume that you would get there? I think Ian Poulter's been somewhat so. He's a very different character to you, mm. a similar backstory in that way. Loads of people who know what they're talking about telling you, you're never going to get there. Yeah. Oh, it's just stubborn stubbornness. I mean, you know, my, my mum always says, geez, you're one of, one of the most stubborn people I know. <laughs> But I find that as a good thing, and I think in golf you need to be a little bit that way, a bit pig-headed and bullish, so that when people tell you one thing, well, uh, my attitude was always, well, screw you, I'm going to prove you wrong. Like Troy, I'm going to beat you. Yeah, exactly. Whereas a lot of people go, oh, really, I'm not good enough? Well, maybe I should try and think Mm. about something else. But the other side of that is I also had a very understanding wife um, because we were married early. I was 22, Alana was 21, and when I said, look, I want to go out and play for a living, she said, okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Let's, let's do it. And I think what she saw and what I always never lacked was a work ethic. I was very, very determined as far as the amount of hours I put in. I'd, I'd be a you know, sun up to sun down type guy. I just didn't know the right way to go about it at that particular point to be good enough to play. So that's the obvious next question. How do you get from four <laughs> to number 16 in the world? What's the roadmap? Do you start with a roadmap or do you stumble across the methods that you need along the way? How did you do it? There was a real, there's there's been sort of two turning points, I guess, in my career early on. And the first one came at a golf tournament up in Geraldton. We were playing the Spalding Park Open, Mm -hmm. part of the May circuit. And I think I shot 82, 88, 86 to finish dead last. Going fabulously. Yeah, really good. (laughs) You're out to five. You might win the Wednesday comp. (laughs) The only way's up, right? So Alana and I had a conversation in the car park afterwards and I was actually in tears And we came to the conclusion, and it was more so from her going, look, if we're going to give this a go, you need to – we need to have a path here. Because I was sort of meandering along, playing pro-am circuits, practicing hard, but with no real purpose or direction. Your good golf, I imagine, was good enough, Nick, to say to you that you could get there? Yeah, I could win the odd one-day pro-am. You could shoot 67 or 65 sometimes? Well, maybe Maybe 69, something (laughs) like that. (laughs) So what we did is we came up with a three-year plan. And firstly, I needed to figure out my golf swing because I was really struggling in that regard. I didn't understand it. Secondly, was it a homemade swing? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. I didn't really have the proper coaching growing up. I had a fantastic short game because I grew up with a park over the road, so I'd always be working on my wedges and chipping around. So the swing was an issue. Uh, the mental side of the game was a problem. I'd be very negative on myself, get down, you know, start worrying about things, which is obviously not good on the golf course. And then thirdly, we also need to work on a bit of fitness, strength, nutrition, that sort of thing. So apart from those three things, I was a world beater. So. <laughs> You're well on the way. <laughs> yeah. So Neil, Neil Simpson uh, just took a, had just taken over as head professional at the Mount Lawley Golf Club, where I was um, still a member at. 
And I had a lesson with him and, and he basically didn't think, you know, I was very good, sort of saying, really, you're a pro, uh, you don't look like one. So We've spoken about this before. We have, That, that yeah. could be a potentially, honestly, that could be a potentially devastating moment for some people, although well, I suppose sure. you'd been hearing it for some time, but still. Well, yeah, but I was, I was with my golf swing, I, I really had no clue. And I was just looking for someone to connect with and understand. And all of a sudden he told me things where I went, oh, okay, that's, that's what I'm meant to be doing. So the light bulb went off between Neil and I as far as, or sorry, went on, so to speak. And we connected really well from the golf swing standpoint. Mental game, not so much. He would tell me things like, oh, maybe, I, maybe I don't want to think about that, Neil. So, <laughs> but that's when I also started working with Neil McLean. Alana rang up the West Coast Eagles and said, who's the sports psychologist? And it was Neil McLean at the time in Perth. So he really gave me the foundations and the structures uh, for the mental side. And then also a couple of other members at the Mount Lawley Golf Club were osteopaths, the Axich brothers, and they helped me out with my body and getting me into the gym and things like that. So, and what so, to work on in the gym. Yeah. You just go to the gym, do you? You've got to work on the right things. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So in that sense, I started, in a way, building a team, a team around me, which I didn't really think about at the time. But the interesting part thing is that that three-year plan we put in place, when you send that out there almost into the universe, so to speak, I'm a bit of a believer in karma and you know the energy and things like that, the right people come into your life at the right time. And we set a goal of, okay, how can I be exempt within three years on the Australasian tour? And as it turned out, I achieved that within 15 months um, because I ended up Monday qualifying to get into the 1997 Australian Open. Uh, led after two rounds and finished fifth. And that was sort of the next turning point in my career where it gave me the belief and the confidence to say, okay, hang on, I think I can do this for a living. We'll come to it a bit later. There's a little bit of a hippie in you, Nick Ahern, which is probably somewhat incongruous with life on the US PGA Tour, I would imagine. Not a lot of wokesters and hippies amongst that crowd. That Australian Open that you mentioned, and I recall that. I was working in the industry at the time. This, who's this Nick Ahern? And we started mm. hearing all sorts of rumours about this kid, Nick Ahern. He's a great match player. Don't blame him <laughs> for money. He's been ripping up the mini tours in Tropo Tour and some of those sorts of things. Was any of that or all of that true? And how good were those circuits and that golf background for what was to come later? Was mm. that a good grounding for mm. playing at the very top levels of the game? Oh, very much so. I mean, when I say I achieved it in 15 months, well, those previous 15 months after I started working with the two Neils and getting my you know fitness going, I was just getting better every day. And I had very much a philosophy as, okay, how can I get better today? And if you can approach every day and for the young pros and anyone in sport or in life in general out there, if you approach every day thinking, how can I be better when I go to bed at night than when I woke up this morning, and structure your day around that philosophy, your improvement can actually uh, go ahead in leaps and bounds, so to speak, just through, the, just through the way you structure your day. So how you do that is a whole other story. <laughs> but yeah, you talk about the pro-ams, the mini tours. I just started all of a sudden putting some rounds together. I'd win, I'd win one-day events, but I struggled with the two- and three-day events. And then all of a sudden, I'd win a three-day tournament. And all of a sudden, you know, the confidence grew, and I really started sort of not dominating, but I really started playing well in all these other little local mini circuits throughout Australia. And, and they're a great breeding ground, but at the end of the day, what you want to do is play four-round events. So once I had my exempt status in Australia, after that – I looked elsewhere going, well, what do I do now? Because I don't have an international card. Yes, I can play here in Australia, but when the big events aren't on, all I've got to play are these one- and two-day events, and you're not going to learn a lot about your game doing that. So that's when you need to venture. That's right. You need to go to the next Mm. level. Yeah, and I did that in the late 90s. We went to the US to play mini tours, and you learn so much about your game over there because you've got to pony up your own cash. You know, it's five, $600 US to enter an event, a three- or four-day event, and unless you finish top five or top ten, you're not getting your money back. There's no food and accommodation <laughs> thrown in with that either, is there? No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's expen- just the- Yeah, you learn how to sleep in your car and yeah. some pretty dodgy hotels. But as I said, I had a very understanding wife because Alana was with me. But over, we went over for about three or four months and I learned so much about my game over there, just um, how to compete, how to score and how to play when you're not playing well. Because the Americans are very good at that. You know, they 
they have an ability to get the ball in the hole and they don't really care how they do it. There's so many of them, isn't there, Nick? Mm. And it breeds somewhat that attitude you're talking about, the, the thing you had with your brother mm. of it doesn't matter how you do it or how mm. it looks, yeah. just get it in the hole because it's just a numbers game. If you want to get into college, mm-hmm. you've got to shoot the number. No one cares what it looks like. It's a different attitude culturally, I think, to Australia here, don't you think, with our high-performance programs and those sorts of things? Mm, very much so. And and it, it can go two ways in the States because through sheer numbers, you're going to get good players, mm-hmm. but at the same time, maybe the fundamentals and the technical mm-hmm. aspects for a long-term career aren't you know, built in early on. That's where we're so good here in Australia. We, we focus on quality over quantity because we don't have the quantity through in sheer numbers. And in the US through the college programs, at the time when I was over there, it was very much a win-at-all-cost attitude. The coach, for him to keep his job, we need to win. So recruiting was a big thing over there, obviously, but People weren't learning the fundamental skills, I think, for a long-term career. Now it's changed over there. They're very much into their programs and developing people as they go along. They're still at a win-at-all-cost attitude, but they're also doing the foundations or laying the foundations, so to speak, to provide a lot of players with, with long-term careers. Yeah, indeed. You must have seen some things on those mini tours. It all sounds like a wonderful <laughs> adventure, and I'm so sure elements of it were, but was it all? Do we, we all look back at our past, I think, through rose colour mm. glass. We were all much better the further back we look, obviously. Was it all beer and Skittles, or were there times – this game can drive people mad. You try to oh, pursue yeah. it for a living, you can literally drive people mad, mm. and you can spend a lot of money and run up a lifetime worth of <laughs> Debt, chasing a dream. Was it all good times, or was it? Oh no, it's, um, it was great. Obviously, you know when you look back, but going through it, there were some shocking moments. Um, you know, I remember. I mean, we're talking about mini circuits and pro am events. One of the worst of it times was I played a tournament in Mount Isa, uh, which is you know, ten, twelve hours inland uh, in the south. I guess you'd call it southwestern part of Queensland. And we had to drive from there after the tournament finished to Mackay, which is about a 13-hour drive. And we smashed our windscreen about two or three hours into the trip. And, and I always remember, um, you know, I'm driving with this no windshield and Alana's hanging onto the, the roof because we had this camper van. She's hanging onto the roof to keep it down. And we've got trucks coming past and we're just hoping they don't kick up more rocks into the windscreen. And, you know, there's just moments like that. You look back and you go, oh, isn't that amazing? Yeah. But at the time, we were just fearing for our lives. Yeah. And then even, you know, in the US, some of the worst hotel rooms you could ever think. I mean, we had mushrooms growing out of the carpets in a couple of them and things Ooh. like that. So I've drunk at places like that. That's, <laughs> no, that's, uh, that's some unpleasant. dodgy places over there. Can it be hard to see from there where you ended up? It's always, looking back always gives you one perspective. But looking back and then trying to look back forward, could mm. you see... What's unfolding? We'll come to the fact that you're now a published author twice. <laughs> when you're looking at the mushrooms coming out of the carpet, is it hard sometimes to see? Hmm. The oh, PGA for sure. Tour? Yeah, I'm, I'm, even Alana and I, we you know, speak about it, well, once in a while, and we go, how the heck did we do this? This is kind of bizarre where we came from. But I think at the time, we just had a bit of an unshakable belief that the fact that we were just going to plot along and keep going. We never really had a, a long-term goal. It was just more, okay, what's next? Let's play well at this tournament. What's after that? What's after that? You know, when I said I had a three-year plan, that was more about building the foundations for what might, might become. And then as every year went on, at the start of every year when I was playing full-time, it was like, okay, how can I get better this year? And I never looked to, well, I want to be top 10 in the world or I want to be top 50. It was more, well, I need to work on my short game. What areas do I need to work on there? How can I get better mentally? How can I improve my fitness? All those kind of process type things. Top 10 is like trying to grab vapor, isn't yeah. it? You can't really control yeah. that. You, can, yeah. you might get there, you might not, but there's no real... No, there's a, great, there's a great TED talk, and I speak about it in the new book by a guy called Eric Buderak, who uh, was a Division three college tennis player. And he speaks about all his teammates at the time and all the people he knew back in college, their, their goal was to be number one in the world. And they were failing every day because they weren't well, achieving it. Well. He said his goals were built around what can I achieve today? And for him, it might have been, well, I want to learn how to slide on red clay. I'm going to learn how to do that today. And at the end of the day, he could. So he achieved something. So as I said before, how do you get better today? That's sort of the philosophy I took into it. And Eric's got a great story. Look it up on, you know, it's one of those TED Talks on YouTube. It's a brilliant story. And it really shows the inner workings of how I think you can improve and, and become a better athlete without getting caught up in the big picture too much. Because that's that's what a lot of the young players I see today, you know, they, 
you see them all on TV, obviously, and you always see the best players on TV. You never you see the other no, thousands no. that are behind it, grinding it away on the mini tours. And, and well, even he, the guys not playing well that week, mm. nobody shows you the guy no. looking to make a cut on Friday, a putt for to make the cut. If that's what they should most show, though. That's the thing. There are there is a there is a case to be made. In fact, you would follow, I'm sure, uh, a case of the golf Monday Q info on Twitter. He he does all the stuff about the guys doing the Monday cues. It's incredibly compelling. Yeah. No, I mean, I think I think come Friday afternoon on all the networks, they should be showing the guys on the cut line. The and, cut channel. And watch them. Yeah, the cut <laughs> channel. Watch them play the last hole, the last two holes, and just see the amount of pressure they're under because golf's one of those unique sports. If you don't perform, you don't get paid. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you have your sponsors and things on the sides, but... Yeah, you miss. They don't last if you're not uh, <laughs> if you're not making cuts. Miss six cuts in a row, and all of a sudden people don't hang yeah. around. Yeah, for sure. That's exactly right. What about the business of it, Nick? Were you surprised? Were you prepared for? I think there comes a point when you play at the level you have, where the golf course becomes a bit of a sanctuary, mm. and golf is a business for you, where you are your own brand. There's a whole business side, isn't there? You mentioned sponsors, and Ping is one. The the other sponsors that you might have, commitments that you might have outside of. Mm. Thursday must come in, oh, thank God I get to play golf (laughs) instead of deal with all this other nonsense. Well, because I was kind of low-key in a way with how I went about my business when I played, that was never a big concern. I didn't have massive sponsors or anything. Ping was my main one. Mm. Titleists were great. They'd give me balls, shoes, gloves, Mm. things like that. But I really didn't have much in the way of sponsorship. So Corporate days of yeah, I do the odd one here and there, but it wasn't, you know, I wasn't being asked to go to the media center every, every you know, after every practice round or anything like that. And one of the big things I like playing in the US was I think at the time I was ranked top 30 in the world and I hadn't won a PGA Tour event. And whenever I did a press conference, they'd hound me about that for the whole 10 minutes. You know, I go, why haven't you won? I'm saying, it's not like I'm not trying to win. Well, how can you justify the fact you're top 30 in the world? Well, <laughs> I didn't write the algorithm. <laughs> exactly. I always used to say, well, I see it as a positive. I must be playing some pretty consistent golf here, you know. So, yeah, but that, that was my style of game. Um, I'd never overpowered golf course. I didn't hit the ball a very long way. I hit the ball straight. I chipped and putted pretty well, and I had a good head on my shoulders. So that'll lead you to a lot of top 10s. But wins, unfortunately, it didn't give me many. I had a few, but not too many. How do you feel about that? Oh, I would have loved to have won more tournaments. And there's and look, I always think back, yep, I can remember two or three good ones where I should have won uh, and I just didn't finish it off rightly. Whether I was, you know, I hit a bad shot here or there, which is more a mental execution error, things like that. And then there was two or three where someone just grabbed it from me. I was like, I remember playing the uh, tournament up in Qatar one year and I had two shot lead with two to go and I finished par par and I lost. My playing partner, Ratif Goosen, finished birdie eagle. He held a 60-footer on the last to beat me. Never yeah. heard of again since. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and everyone afterwards yeah, yeah. came up to me and said, we can't believe that no. just happened, you know. So it, those little things, you know, as you can tell, I'm over them. Yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine how Doug Sanders feels. He sometimes goes yeah. five minutes without thinking about that, but he says. Uh, Jeff Ogilvy once talked about the would-haves, could-haves and should-haves. You, you can, when you look back, aren't you? You mm. can see the ones that mm, should have won that one. Eh, could have won that one, you know. No, I... Oh, absolutely. I mean, for me, the, the, the one that sort of grinds me the most, I've, I've always wanted to win the Australian Open, and I finished runner-up. Had the game good. for it too, Nick. You yeah. You contended many times at I the had, Australian Open. I had a lot of top tens, and I had three runner-ups. Uh, the one that got away was at uh, the Australian Golf Club in 2007, where I had a, I think I had a one-shot lead with, with three to go um, and finish bogey, bogey, birdie. And, I mean, it's not easy holes, 16 and 17, but I – I, I could have, uh, if I'd have just could have snuck a couple of pars in there and 18, I had a, ended up having an eagle putt which slipped out, which would have got in a playoff with Craig Perry. And that was the one that really just kind of mm, irks me players, to this day. A couple of players had a chance to do that. One June Lee, I think. Yeah. Uh, Paz has so done it to me a couple of times. You know, the Heineken here at Royal Melbourne. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Gritty competitors. Golf looked very different even just 15 years ago, didn't it? Craig Parry still being competitive. Peter Senior, of course, won the Triple Crown in his 50s here in Australia, all after the age of 50. The game's changed, hasn't it? Has it changed that much? When you started to play that late 90s era, it was probably mm. when we really started to see technology really impact the game. And I think we're really seeing the, the end of that sort of process or what the, the fruits of that mm. now. Yeah, it was starting to change around that time, but... For a player like myself, it wasn't long. With technology, wasn't that big a deal. I grew up playing with persimmon clubs, obviously, so my game was built more on control, not not power. Those styles of player could certainly compete, uh, but nowadays they they just can't because the golf courses are so long. And me hitting a five iron into a hole where other players are hitting nine iron wedges is the difference over, that big? 
Oh, it would, it would be now, for sure. Yeah, I mean, most guys would have me by 30 metres off the tee, plus they're going to be another, at least another club longer with their iron. So there's, an, there's 40 metres, so there's four clubs, basically, at least. Um, so that style of player, you know, you saw the Corey Pavins, the mm. Fred Funks, those kinds of guys. I used to love playing with them because I could have a driving competition <laughs> with them. <laughs> finally, yeah. finally, someone we can compete with in that way. So there, there were courses you could compete on. I mean, Hilton Head was my favourite in the US. The Colonial yep. uh, Memorial was a bit like that. The courses here in Australia where they're a little firmer and faster, where length isn't a factor. I mean, you play the Australian Open this year coming up at uh, Victoria, for instance. I could compete around there. Kingston Heath, I've seen where they've put some of those new tees. That's, that'd yeah. be a tough challenge. One of them's almost in the dining room. Yeah. <laughs> it's that far back. So, But for the young players, they're just built to you know create speed and hit the ball a long way, and it's not their own. It's not their no, fault. No, no, of course not. They're, just playing, just, they're playing the game that's been yeah. asked of them. Yeah, and, it, and it's come about because of two things, the, the size of the driver and, and the golf ball. So that could be curtailed in an instant. You know, you could you could make a ball which spins a little more and you could reduce the size of the, the, the sweet spot on the driver and all of a sudden players wouldn't be lashing at it so much because their miss hits would go sideways. So Should it change, Nick? Personally, I think they should bifurcate the rules, yeah. For the average golfer out there, no problem. Let them use the technology, whatever you want. But when you're talking about national opens in the amateur le- level or professional tournaments, there, there should be other equipment, I think, that you'd not forced to use, but you have the choice. You can either play or you don't. And, you know, it's like baseball in the in the US. They still use wooden bats over there. Uh, they don't change the size of the stadiums or the arenas. Um, it's up to the players to adapt accordingly, and I think you could do that with golf courses. Rather than lengthening courses, you, we could have this discussion for quite a while. But I've been having it for I'm a number sure of years have. now with Mike Clayton and Jeff Shackleford yeah. and several others, and some people think it's boring. Mm. There's a generation of golfers, young golfers, who wouldn't understand this notion Players of your era will often say, and I wonder whether you agree, the driver used to be the most difficult mm. club in the bag to hit, and it's now the easiest. Is Correct. that true? Absolutely, yeah. If, if I ever get nervous now on a tee shot, I'll just pull the driver out because I know I can hit it reasonably straight. Whereas the three-wood head actually looks, oh, this is a bit smaller. Hang on, I wouldn't, you know, whereas in the days gone past, you'd take the three-wood, not the driver. <laughs> so the interesting thing is, What's going to happen at the British Open this year? The Open Champion at St Andrews, how the course will hold up if the weather's not breezy and, and, and difficult. If the weather's yeah, difficult, they're, not, they're going to struggle with it. But if are, it's calm you, out there... Are you in the camp that thinks that 60 is under threat? Oh, could see a score in the it 50s? Could be. Of course. Uh, it's, you've still got a whole lot of putts. Yeah, of course. And, and interestingly, you know, when you slow greens down that much because they're pretty slow greens at St Andrews. They weren't in 2015 when they had to call uh, off because of the wind. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> if you recall. Yeah. But Lynx courses, the greens are slower. So yes. people don't hold as many putts, I don't think, when they're a little slower. They're almost easier when they're quicker. So it'll be interesting to see. But, yeah, I, I think it's definitely on if there's no weather, if, if there's no wind, that is. Will that be the turning point? Hopefully. I mean, it, I think it needs to happen at some point. But, again... We're just seeing, you know, we, we've been talking about Bryson DeChambeau, you know, in recent years. Now he's injured himself, obviously, so he's out for a little while. Not but to do it with the long hitting, Nick. Of he course not. No, no. But <laughs> I'm pretty sure college programs in the US are looking at players not so much on their playing ability, but how, ca- how far they can hit it yeah, and club at speed. speed. Yeah. So we're going to be seeing people that hit the ball 500 yards consistently pretty soon, maybe in five to 10 years. Now, you know, people, the older generation of golfers have probably been saying that for years, but it's coming, that's for sure. And I kind of referenced it in, a little bit in the book where, you know, the average driving distance on the PGA Tour a few years ago was uh, 300 yards, and there might have been 60 or 70 guys that averaged above that. On the Corn Ferry Tour, there's probably 120 or 130 guys that average above 300, and that's the scary part because they're the next guys coming. Well, that's right. The, the freak in one generation is the norm, the mm. next, and that's true in all sports, isn't it? Jack Nicholas was an unthinkable proposition in the 60s. Uh, Tiger Woods was unthinkable. John Daly was unimaginable. Davis Love was unimaginable. Mm. You know, Greg Norman at 280 was unimaginable. There's he, always yeah. – He'd be sixth on the LPGA driving average. <laughs> now, there are five players on the LPGA that average over – 280 yards. And wow. so yeah. that's in the space of 20. Do you feel that's accelerated? I feel like there was a, a long period where the game was somewhat recognisable across generations, mm. but that this last 30 years has been a really genuine shift into a game that's 
genuinely unrecognisable. He used to say that about, you know, he plays a game with which I'm not familiar. Mm. That's really true now, I would imagine. Yeah, I think it's happening faster. I mean, technology in all aspects of life is just getting, you know, faster and bigger, stronger. I mean, I can't even remember the days before the iPhone, right? So, Was there days before? Yeah, I think exactly. there were. Yeah, you're right. Um, before the mobile phone, yeah. Nick, there'll, be a whole, there'll be a whole lot of kids out there that won't believe that you used to organise where to meet before you went there yeah. and you'd just meet when you got there. Exactly. So... Yeah, it's it's changing fast and rapidly, but I still love seeing the tournaments where you play a short course or a or a shorter hole where they struggle. I mean, they're they're the most fascinating holes, golf courses for me, like a Hilton Head, for instance. Yeah. 10th Royal Melbourne West here just mm. across the road. Well, I think I saw Dustin Johnson at the President's Cup. I think he picked it up after seven ones. <laughs> it still wasn't in the hole. Yeah. And he did a two iron off the tee. <laughs> well, was... There you go. No, and that's the beauty of golf is it will always find a way to even things out. But at the same time, look, if they're shooting 24 under par, well, so be it. Who's to say that's a good or a bad thing? But I'm more in the camp of why don't we just dial things back a little and, and, and sort of get players using their head a bit more than their, than their brawn. Yeah. Has that have, have you seen a change? I think it's been a couple of years now since you've been mm. lived in America and some years since you were on the tour in America. But on the tour, and you would have fraternised with the, some of those young up and coming professionals living in Florida, where mm-hmm. a lot of them live. Did you see a change? Could you pinpoint a sort of a time or a generation? I mean, we often talk about the cast of twenty eleven: Jordan Spieth, Justin Thomas. Yeah, that period there. Yeah, it was in that early two thousand ten to fifteen range. I think where I've I started playing towards the end of my career because I wasn't fully exempt on the PGA tour. I had to play a year on the Corn Ferry tour. Mm-hmm. And Scary stuff, isn't it? <laughs> I found that tour harder than the main tour because I'd shoot – I had two weeks in a row. I shot five under one week, missed the cut, six under the next week, missed the, missed cut, the cut, thinking, okay, I've just played some pretty good golf here on not that easy of golf courses. But, yeah, I mean, if you didn't shoot 20 under for the week, you were going to be outside the top 10 and really not making an egg. So on the main tour, you shoot eight under, you're going to be top 10 and you're going to be up there unless it's a course like – you know, every now and then they get one where they really go low on. But the PGA Tour for me, funnily enough, was easier than the Corn Ferry Tour, which is a scary thing to say. It's somewhat intriguing, is it not, Nick? I think you're absolutely right. Those weeks that you shot five and six under and missed the cut, chances are you probably would have shot five or six under had you been playing the PGA Tour course that week, a much harder course. And those guys who were at 12 and 14 under making the cut on the Corn Ferry Tour may have missed the cut on the PGA Tour. Can you explain that? That's a, It's a bizarre <laughs> game, is it not? Well, the Corn Ferry courses are a little, mm. you know, they're not they're set, set up. up for they're that. set up, They, yeah. they so want birdie fests. They're set up to smash the ball as far as you can, which the Americans do really well and all the younger international players as well, and to putt well. So there's no real penalty if you go a little way offline on the Corn Ferry Tour. So this, the course is set up more like a par 68 for those players because they can reach all the par fives and then it just depends if they can make a few putts and on the other holes and there's your five, six hundred per round per type, type scenario. Whereas on the main tour, it's you know not quite set up in that regard. You know, I mentor uh, a few different young pros at the moment, and then I also coach you know fifteen markers, twenty seven handicappers. And the one thing I always impress to to golfers is golf isn't about the quality of your good shots; it's about the quality of your bad ones. And can you still make a score from it? And my favourite days in looking back were. The days I shot one or two under where I really should have shot 78 or 79 or 76 or something like that. And the best players, you talk about Peter Senior, he was one of the best at it. Bulldog. Where he could just turn that 74 into a 69 or a 70 and it didn't look any different. But he just found a way to get the ball in the hole. And and having that ability, that knack to, to do that is is where careers are built around because I find... Learn skill or innate a bit of both. I think there's a bit of both in it. You can certainly learn it. A lot of the young pros I try and help, they're, they're looking for perfection. And I always say, don't. you can always strive for perfection, but you're never going to attain it. So you'll have rounds where you'll go, yeah, I'm flushing it. This is fantastic. And in a sense, maybe when I first helped Jordan Zunik out, that was a, a case where I walked 18 holes with him at the PGA up at Royal Pines uh, just to sort of get a sense of his game and have a chat. Gifted player. Amazingly physically. talented. Gifted, yeah. yeah. But after six holes, I sort of said to him, what, um, how do you think you're playing? He says, oh, I'm a bit scratchy at the moment. You know, I'm, I'm playing okay, but nothing too fancy. And I said, you've just flushed it for six holes. And he said, really? That was flushing it? I said, you hit a five iron from 205 yards to 20 feet. That's an amazing shot on the golf course. And he said, really? Oh, I kind of pushed that a bit. So, <laughs> so I, I, I was, you know, trying to help the young players understand that 
it, it's okay not to be perfect in a way. Uh, it's okay to just hit an okay shot or a bad shot, which is still in play. You can get it up and down or you might hold a long putt, whatever it is, that'll keep your round going. Don't get too caught up in having to be perfect all the time because if you do, you're going to have a short career and golf's going to become a very frustrating game at the same time because it's pretty rare you can put two, three, four, five good shots in a row. I mean, I play around a round of golf and I might hit two shots exactly how I want. The rest are just good misses. In the window there. Mm. Some would, would say in his t- – Ben Hogan once said in his best rounds he might hit five perfect shots and mm. Tiger said, I'm yet to reach those lofty heights. And they might <laughs> be – those guys aren't – we assume as hackers and recreational, they're, they're there making that up. You did, they're just toying with you hit most of your no, shots perfect. No, that's, that's exactly what they're, that they're talking about. I, I played around uh, the other day up at Cathedral Golf Club, which was a lot of fun, and I hit one good shot for the day. I just remember this five wood came off perfectly and it finished a foot away from the hole. The rest of the time, if I hit the shot, I was like, oh, I pushed that a little or it didn't feel quite good. Or I, They were still on the green and still okay, but they were never perfect. And you know, when you talk about perfect and what's good and what's average and what's horrendous, there's, there's a massive divide between those. So you're trying to get rid of the horrendous make your bad ones a bit better, and then your good ones a little better, and so on. Yeah. It's a nice 68 you shot up there, by the way. Yeah, but, uh, something like that. <laughs> something like, uh, so what did Hank Haney say? No penalty shots, no shots, no double chips, and no three putts. They're the score killers. Yeah. Hitting it in penalty areas, mm. not getting it on the green when you've missed a green, yep. and then three putting. If you take those out, yeah. scores you, you win. Tour- you win golf tournaments. Everyone's going to make bogeys, so never be too you know disgruntled with a bogey. A double, yes, they'll hurt you, they especially kill. in U.S. Opens and things like yeah. that. You're always just trying to avoid double bogeys, you know, in, in the in tournaments. Bogeys are okay sometimes, uh, but a lot of as I say, you yeah. do well not to make any, wouldn't you? That yeah. would be an extraordinary. Yeah, that, that's a victory in itself, yeah. not making a double bogey in a tournament through yeah. four rounds. Uh, yeah. You've done pretty well. You mentioned Jordan there, as we said. Gifted, gifted, gifted player. Mm. He's probably a product of a generation in some ways that's grown up with golf on television, much more so than you and I did. Maybe three or four tournaments here you'd see on TV, and then the Australian Summer would be on TV. And one of the well, – downside would be the wrong term, but one of the upshots of that is that what you see constantly is players playing incredibly well. Mm. We just talked about it before. No one's showing the guys missing the cut. <laughs> if you only watch television, that's all you see. That's a very skewed view of golf, mm. isn't it? The very best in the world playing their best every week <laughs> is not what that golf looks like for them all the time either, is it? Very true. I remember living in the US and we are in the locker room one day and someone said, wouldn't it be great to be Tiger Woods? Because every time you turn the TV on, all <laughs> as you see is you're on Sports Center top 10, winning great tournaments, job. holding putts. It'd be hard to think you're a bad golfer, right? <laughs> Whereas most people, you know, they have the memory bank of, oh, I hit this bad shot, I hit that bad shot, and that's kind of – obviously you don't want to remember those things, but you know it's there. But for the viewer out there, yeah, you think every putt's holdable and every shot's great, but if you showed an entire tournament or if you showed players on the cut line, you'd, you'd see some very interesting stuff. One of the joys of going and watching golf live, I think, is seeing the poor shots. It's a real revelation mm. for most golfers to go, go to, to a professional th- tournament and see some of the poor shots. Go to the range. That's where you see it. <laughs> <laughs> see the odd tantrum. Then we saw Bryson have a tantrum at the Open a couple of years ago, didn't we, with sort of the club tournament. You mentioned the magic word tiger in, our, in this generation. How good – we know you beat him twice at the match play, and you've been over that a number of times. I'm sure you never tire of talking about it. <laughs> However, how special is he, do you reckon? Oh. Now, do we still somehow underrate him? I think – Today's players, well, for a period there, they probably did because they hadn't grown up playing with him. They all said they wanted to have a go yeah. at his best, didn't they? It was, David it wasn't Duval. it Duval who just said, no, you really he don't? Said, <laughs> he said, the hell you do because this guy will eat you alive. And and I think a lot of the players found that out at the Masters when, you know, on that back nine when he just did his thing and everyone crumbled. So they got a glimpse into what he did week in, week out. And he was just, yeah, he's a once in a lifetime, whatever you want to call it. Is he the well, greatest? It's not a generation, is it? It's, no, it's more it's than a generation. More. It's going to be more than a generation before. I mean, him and up. Jack are obviously the two leading players, but then you could also put Hogan and Nelson and end them up there, but you, it's so hard to go across you know, generations. And we never saw and them that. either, Nico. Yeah. Peter Costas made that point on this very podcast when he spoke to John Hogan, is that television changes everything. Mm. We suddenly, had we had footage of everything Sneed did and Nelson did, yeah. we'd have a very yeah. different perspective about Absolutely. And on the female side, is it Babe uh, Babe Zaharis. Zaharis. Yeah. She was, right, 80-something yeah. tournaments. Kathy Whitworth, oh, um, extraordinary players. 88 tournaments, I think, Kathy. And yeah. her, her mantra, her, you know what her theory was playing golf? Hit the middle of the green. Wow. That's all she did. Aim for the centre of the Thompson, green. Peter Thompson, similarly. Yeah. Don't three-putt. Yeah, that's right. So 
But with Tiger, it's, you know, I hope we see him again, uh, which we will, obviously. He's talking about Southern Hills, the Open at St. Andrews. That'll oh, be a fun one to watch. I thought that's where he was going to come back. I wonder whether the Masters and the PGA, in a funny way, not that he's not trying to win, it might be his warm-up for what he would no doubt believe is his best chance, I would think, all yeah. things considered. And knowing what I've seen of Tiger, because I lived in the same housing estate as him in the U.S., he had put a lot of time and work into his practice and his game before the Masters. Everyone sort of thought, oh, well, wow, this is out of nowhere. I can promise no, no. you. He'd done months and months and months of work and rehab and everything he does is revolved around how he, can I win the next tournament. He wouldn't go out publicly and play golf, even in the father-son thing. It, it is, he's not going to embarrass no. himself and tarnish that legacy unless he <laughs> thinks he can do it. So he's handled that side of it brilliantly, hasn't he? I mean, you said before you didn't do a lot of the corporate and that sort of stuff. A peek into his world is like another planet, mm. is it not? Very much so. Yeah, he's in his own bubble, his own world. I mean, when I was, as I say, we'd be practicing at Isleworth in the US and he'd be there from dawn till dusk type stuff. He'd be up hitting balls early, go for a jog, hit the gym, come back, hit more balls, go have lunch, get do another workout and then come back, hit more balls, go play, and it would just be unbelievable to watch. Not only was he the most talented, but he's also the hardest worker. That's it. And my, I know my body couldn't take what he did, and maybe it's showing you know, over the years that his body can't as well, but I think his injuries have come more from outside activities than golf. So uh, it's at the same time a, a privilege to be able to play in in that uh, in his era. You were a peer. And see what he did. A, a fellow professional. Mm. There's a natural respect there. You're both PGA Tour players. Yeah, he might be the best player in the world, maybe one of the best in history, but my goodness, mm. you've been inside sort of that bubble. Did you ever reflect on that when you played the PGA Tour in particular? Or is the best talent? You could make arguments about the courses and some other things about the PGA Tour, but no doubt the talent pool on the PGA Tour is the very best mm. in the world. Is there any time to reflect on that while you're living it? Not really, because if you did, then you'd think, oh, gosh, really? Uh, <laughs> do I really belong here? <laughs> so, no, I, I I just thought, well, this is how it is. is, is it's what you do. It's what I do, and, and I've got to work hard to keep maintaining what I'm doing. So my, in a selfish way, it was all about how can I get better? Uh, I wasn't trying to look at other players and think, well, geez, they're so much better than me. It wasn't a case of that. I, I looked at other players and thought, well, what do they do really well? And what do they not do well? And maybe I'd pick up on something where, oh, okay, he can hit this shot. I wonder. So I'd just ask a question here and there. Like Lee Jansen was a, a, an interesting case. He you know, won a couple of US Opens and he had a phenomenal short game around the green. And he used to hit this shot out of long, thick rough. And I was always curious to see how he did it. And I was chatting to him one day at Isleworth on the practice green. He says, well, I opened the face and I kind of had this hooking action. I thought, a hooking action? That's a really weird way to do it. And I started practicing. I thought, wow, okay. That works really well on this long grass. and So you pick up little bits and pieces here along the way from other players. That's always a good thing. you know. And play and practice with players that are better with you as well. That's a real key to it, which, uh, which isn't hard a lot of the times for a lot of people. Um, the one thing to avoid out there is to have dinner with people who three-putt a lot because <laughs> <laughs> that, negativity, that negativity carries over pretty quickly. So always hang out with positive people, yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> indeed. There must come a point, Nick, where – Attitude trumps aptitude. Mm -hmm. You've got to have a certain level of aptitude to be one of the 150 teeing it up each week. That's a given. And then it's all about attitude, isn't it? Mm. Well, that's the separation between the good and the great players is, yes, they can all have these physical capabilities and they can all hit the ball from here to there and putt well. But the difference between the good and great is, is what's between the ears. It's it's that simple. And, and, you know, we've spoken about Tiger was the best at it because he could make – Things on a Sunday afternoon look as though it was a Thursday morning, um, whereas the good players, yeah, they struggle on a Sunday afternoon. They can do it Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but come the back nine on Sunday, they they struggled. And, and I was one of those, you know, I was always trying to improve that myself. And it's the best players in a way, it's funny, whatever sport you watch, they almost make time slow down. Yeah. And they just have... It's like an effortless type thing. I remember I, I love watching the NFL and Tom Brady, you know, who's the Patriots quarterback and now the Buccaneers quarterback, uh, watching him in the Super Bowls was always amazing because he just made it look like a regular season game and he had all the time in the world whereas everyone else was panicking and he just thought, yep, I'm just going to get the job done, do my fundamentals, do it well and he had the belief to back it up as well. So that's where the great ones come to their fore, so to speak. What's that about, Nick? It's the same game. It's the same course. It's the same set of holes. The only thing that's changed is the time. Yeah. Well, it's it's how you perceive it. 
really. It's, you know, Tiger is always, you know, I've, I've heard him speak about this before. You have a three-foot putt. It doesn't matter if it's for a practice round or if it's the, to win a putt at the Masters. It's still a three-foot putt. So you have to go about preparing and, and approaching that shot or that play in other sports the same way as you always would. So there's no difference. We and attach the, consequences, don't we? We attach oh, consequences. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And that's, that's all to do with expectations and things like that. So pressure to me is almost a made-up word because pressure is just the result. Well, all you're thinking about is, is a result. And it's almost a case of I don't want to screw up, basically, is where pressure comes from. So like a fear of failure. Whereas if you think, well, okay, if I do make or miss this, is it going to change me? Not really. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it my best attempt and I'm going to put 100% every effort I can into it without attachment to that result. And if you do that, everything's okay. It's like a three-foot – I always talk to people about a three-foot putt. It's probably the most mental part of the game because you either make it or you miss it. So, 50-50 proposition. <laughs> well, <laughs> depends, <putts> are. <laughs> depends on how good a putter you are, I guess, in that regard. So a three-foot putt is the ultimate mental challenge. Either make it or you miss it. And it counts the same strokes, basically. It's either one or two strokes. Interestingly enough, you know, I spoke to Ian Baker Finch about this many years ago. And I said to him, obviously his full swing you know, problems are well documented. But he's still one of the greatest putters in the world, I think, if you ever play a practice round when he putts lights out. And I said to him, why did you have issues with the full swing and yet it didn't carry over into your short, you know, into the putting? And he said, well... Tough question to ask, by the way. Oh, yeah. (laughs) You would have thought about that before you put that one. Oh, I did. But we were playing a social game and he was okay with it. And he said, well, you know, I'd stand on some tees and I'd think, I'm not sure if I've got enough golf balls in my bag to finish this hole, which... You know, from a mental perspective, and I've been there before. That's I, I've, a awful place to be. Isn't it? Oh, it is. I, I've had events where I've stood up there thinking, I have no clue where this ball's going. This is not going to be good. But you just got to get, get up. The crowd yeah, off yeah the exactly. Right. And yet, with the three foot putt, he said, I just figured, well, if I miss the putt, I can still tap the next one in. So it's only one stroke. I'm okay. So he didn't suffer the yips or anything like that. And he's an amazing putter. I mean, it's, if you ever get a chance, have a oh. have a putting lesson off Ian Baker Vince. He's the best in with the world. With a glove on. That's with a glove on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So I sort of talk to people about the three-foot part and how it becomes more of a a mental battle. And if you can take the result out of the equation, which is a very hard thing to do because the hole's right there in front of you, if you can take that result out of it, and there are tricks to do it, uh, it becomes quite a simple process because if you focus, as I say, more on the process, not on the result, if you execute execute a good process, the result tends to work out in your favour. But Generally, we miss three-foot putts because we don't put a good stroke on it. We don't roll the ball well. If you do roll the ball well, you very, very rarely miss a three-foot putt. Three foot. So there's, a, there's an art to training in, in that sense. Could we make the case that golf should change its name to easier said than done? Because <laughs> that's all very simple, isn't it, Nick, until you stand over a three-foot putt that matters. Yes, very much so. <laughs> well, that's where training the mind comes around to it, and that's why golf is probably the most mental sport there is because the ball is stationary. Most other sports, just about every other sport apart from billiards or pool, is the ball's moving. So you're reacting Mm -hmm. to the the ball, to the target. In golf, the ball sits there and says, well, hit me. It laughs at you in fact sometimes, Nick. So two things, you've got all the time in the world to think about it (laughs) and you have to create the ball's movement. And that's why I think in other sports like, say, AFL or or soccer, the hardest parts or the most mental part about those sports are set shots on goal or penalty kicks because you can just see there's no rhythm to it. They're just very much stop, start, oh, what? do I do and all that and the pressure you can almost see the pressure build up now the best ones the best kickers in the history of the football you know like I could take Jason Dunstall or someone like that he had a little process that he followed and that's what they did they just followed the process put a good kick on the ball and if it goes through it goes through they don't care if they miss in a way and that's what you'll find the best putters do in the world Brad Faxon was very much like that Mm -hmm. you know he had a round of golf where I think he had 35 putts one day Someone said to him afterwards, geez, it's such a shame you didn't putt well. Um, you would have had a good score. And he says, what do you mean I didn't putt well? I putted fantastic. The ball just didn't go in today. The next day, guess what? The ball went in because he just kept doing what he doing. He knew his stroke was good, but some days it just doesn't go in. So it's having that sort of mentality and that mindset that separates the good players from the rest. Mm. How did you learn all of this, did you study? <laughs> uh, uh, we talked just the other week. You've, your second book has just been released and mm. absolutely recommend to people 
go and buy both your first book, which I've read and is fantastic, and the second one, which I've read partly mm-hmm. and is at least as good, but I suspect probably better uh, by the time all's said and done. How did this all come to you, Nick? Well, I was a real big note taker throughout my career. I, I was, and, and it's funny, I was not a very, when I say note taker, um, I wasn't a very statistical player, uh, as in I didn't really follow heavily the stats about what I was doing. But I always hit greens in regular. Oh, I did strokes the basic, I did the basic stuff. Yeah. I still don't know what strokes gain means. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not actually into that sort of thing. Um, but I did really take a lot of notes around, okay, how was I feeling that day? What was, I, what was my preparation like? All those sort of process type things so that I could go back and look at good periods in my playing career and go, what was I doing when I was playing well through that patch? Or what was I doing, you know, what was I thinking about when I was playing poorly? So I could always go back and have a look and I always recommend that for young players. Now, keep a diary. Even the stats, yes, keep all that, but more about how you felt and what your biorhythms were in a way. And was it always golf related or did you sometimes find, oh, that was just after my firstborn came along <laughs> or we just, what, was, or was it generally a golf related thing that would? No, no, you're probably right. I think, uh, you know, through the birth of kids and the you know, upheavals in, in your lives or. or Perspectives seem to yeah. really change for golfers around childbirth. You often see Jordan Spieth probably a back to nine in the world. Mm. Uh, not long after his daughter yeah. was born, having had a – well, he had a $10 million slump, but it was still a slump by his standards. Yeah. Those things can really have a, a – Oh, absolutely. You never know what's going on behind closed doors. But um, sort of getting back to the, the book side of things, yeah, I, I, I never – I'd written for myself throughout my career, and I've, I've got a bunch of diaries at home with all my notes throughout there. But There's then, a third book there. Well, no, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Maybe. But uh, – Yeah, but about six or seven years ago, I was out playing a round of golf with a friend at Isleworth in America where I was living, and I could just see he was having all these mental game struggles, you know, a thousand swing thoughts going through his head. And I said, look, let's just simplify this down. Pick your target, just focus on that, and really really see the target in your mind and what sort of shot you want to hit. And he, he hit a nice shot. And he goes, oh, that was interesting. I kind of kept it simple, didn't you? I said, well, yeah, because I could see your mind was just overloaded with all these thoughts. So we started talking about the mental game and what I used to do. And he said, oh, could you write a few notes for me? So I started writing out a few pages and that turned into five to 10 and 20, 30. And all of a sudden I had my first book on my hand. Did you know all that stuff was there inside you? Or yeah, was it just well, stuff that you did but never gave much thought to? A bit of both. You know, I'd, I'd always done it and I'd always knew what I was doing, but I'd never really written it out. Um, but when I started writing, I thought, well, this is interesting. Yeah, okay, I can see how this has structure to it. But what I thought, well, what would make it good? Because re- I, I, I had the bones for it, but then you go, well, how does, it, how does it become interesting for people? So the way I wrote the first book was almost through stories in my career because people love to read stories about That's things it. rather than say, yes, focus on this, do this, do this. Well, I sort of told it through. Well, I was on the 18th hole and this is what I was thinking about, etc. So through stories is always a good way. And I look back at the first book now and I kind of go, mm, yeah, I could have done that so much better and I wish I wish I'd have done this. Never changes, wish I'd have done that. Yeah. Never changes. Never changes. <laughs> and then the second one came about because of the lockdowns here in Melbourne. I'd always had a, an idea to write a second book. Um, you know, the first one was Tour Mentality. I thought, oh, I could call it Tour Strategy. I want to get more into the strategy and the course management side of things rather than the mental st- – that's mental stuff, but just dive a bit deeper. But that was a very unsexy name. So we came up with uh, how to play your best golf because at the end of the day, I just thought, well, what's it about? Well, it's how do you play your best golf? And what I realized, I guess, over the last few years of coaching and mentoring players was everyone's different. So it's a matter of figuring out what works best for the individual. And that's the art of, I think, being a good coach and what I'm still learning because I have a wide variety of clients at the moment that they learn in different ways and trying to figure that out is is a real key to unlocking how they so can improve. You can devote your life to that, to be sure. a, a coach. So yeah. it's an extraordinary thing to take on. It is. Going all the way back, could you have looked forward and seen that? But particularly if I'd said to you, to 19-year-old Nick, embarking on his professional <laughs> playing career, you'll get to 16 in the world. And then after that, you'll write a couple of books and coach 25 markers. Would I, you believe me? Oh, I could have seen the, the coaching part because I started out a teaching pro. Um, you know, when I was a young trainee, that's what I did. I, I, I and you, did, did you enjoy it I then, did beginner or? clinics and I You know it. a lot of people don't. You know that a lot of guys who play the tour, they couldn't think oh, of anything worse. Oh, pull their own teeth out, I'd imagine. Without <laughs> anaesthetic. Exactly. So... But I get a kick out of watching someone. It's funny, you know, 
a guy sent me a text message yesterday, one of my clients who I started working with a couple of years ago before lockdown started. He was off an 18 handicap and he wanted to get down to single figures. And now he sent me a text yesterday. I did it. He had 42 points and now he's off a 9.7, which is that I really get a kick out of. I mean, that's just so awesome. Um, Another friend of mine in the US, he'd always wanted to break 90. You know, and and the day he broke ninety and shot eighty nine, it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. And it's we all think about watching tour pros winning tournaments on golf courses, but the beauty of this game is everyone can win at something, and you just have your own goals and your own limits. And pressures your own... are funnily enough quite the same, aren't they? Yeah. Tigers Masters pressure and mm. the five markers club championship pressure are absolutely exactly yeah. the same pressure to them. To them, no, that's exactly right, and. Trust me, tour pros get nervous and throw up all over themselves, uh, you know, mentally as much as anyone else. They're just probably better at uh, dealing with it and they have the tools to uh, to get through those situations. So that's kind of what I've always tried to relay to all golfers out there. How can you get better in your own way? Because you've got your own swing, you've got your own putting stroke. I'm not trying to change those things. I'm just trying to help people. You're not mad, are you? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you want to, you want to, you want an achievable it. goal at least. <laughs> well, that's the beauty of it. I mean, I have another guy. He he started on a 15 handicap. He says, "Look, Nick, I'm in my 60s. I don't practice, and I want to get to single figures." And now he's playing off nine. So actually, he's off eight now. I think so. Wow, that's it's amazing. Mm. How many shots are most of us just wasting by not? thinking the right way quite a few depending on your handicap you know if you're an 18 marker i remember talking to you about this a while ago i think craig parry said well i could shave their handicap by 10 strokes, 10 strokes. yeah i think six is a more you know, realistic goal in the beginning because you could do two through two strokes through club selection because a lot of people don't take the right club or they don't take their medicine so to speak they drive it in the rough and rather than chipping out sideways they they play the hero shot which all of a sudden you've got a double or a triple bogey so you do at least a couple of shots there. Another couple through reading greens. That's another big part of the game I think a lot of golfers struggle with. They don't quite know what to look for. And, and speed is so important in putting. I always say speed is more important than line, which is a really strange thing to say to some people. But if you have good speed of the putting, you probably won't three putt. Because it's very rare you're more than three or four foot wide, but you're constantly more than three or four foot short or long. You know, you leave a 30 foot or eight feet short, but you're never eight feet wide. So if you have good speed, you'll rarely three putt. And you can save strokes through that. And then the final piece would be just thinking better, you know, having a pre-shot routine. That's one of the things I always try and help people with. I guess one of the biggest questions that always comes is how can I be a more consistent golfer? That's the most common thing I hear a lot. And I said, well, do you have a pre-shot routine? No. Okay, so you are constantly thinking about things differently for every shot, aren't you? Yes. Okay, you don't think about the same things over the golf ball? You don't vote? No. Okay. Why don't we build a pre-shot routine, and that way when you're over the ball, you have something to focus on that will take your mind away from the result because most bad shots come because you're focusing too much on the result. I was talking about that pressure element a bit earlier. So, So building a routine... A bit of uh, reading greens and thinking more about club selection and course management. There's at least six shots right there. Simple, isn't it? Well, <laughs> it is infuriating. This is the thing about golf. It's the simplest of all games, but it's not easy. A child could understand the concept of golf. Get mm. the ball from here into that little hole up there in the least number of shots possible. There's nothing complicated about that at all. As soon as you stand over the ball, the complications start. Do we, in a funny way, golfers, those who are drawn to golf, is there a funny sort of a part of us that wants the game to be more complicated? It's a great excuse for me. Of course you're better at golf than me, Nick, and of course you got to 16th in the world because you have a different set of gifts. I don't have those gifts, so I'm completely legitimate in whacking it around off 25. What's the question? Sorry. <laughs> Do we overcomplicate it almost deliberately sometimes? Oh, of course. Yeah. we're. You know, it, it, it's not that we're looking for excuses, but – if you don't hit the perfect shot, well, you start analysing and go, well, well, why did that happen? Well, it must have been because of this, this and this, rather than going, no, I just kind of screwed up. You know, my mind wasn't in the right place. A lot of people don't look – they know they're making mistakes, but they're looking for the mistakes in the wrong areas, so to speak. And the number one area I find that people make mistakes in is – they can stand behind a ball and make a decision about what's coming up. Okay, this is the club I want to hit. This is the flight I want to hit. This is where I want to hit it, et cetera, et cetera. But as soon as they step into the ball and they get over the ball, things change. 
and they're not committed, they're not decisive, and they're starting to second guess themselves. And most bad shots come because of that. At the very least, if you can get over every shot and fully commit to what you've decided on, the fully commit to the seven iron you're going to hit into this green and just make a good swing at it, I guarantee you, you'll probably hit a better shot than if you start doubting yourself. Confident shot with the wrong club is yeah. much better than a perfect swing with the, you know, bad swing with the right clubs and all that sort of thing. And that's not saying anything about someone's no, technique no. or anything like that because I've seen some horrific techniques out there and they can still score still, pretty well. Yeah. Mm. That's discipline, isn't it, Nick? Yeah, it's uh, and that's hard work, isn't it? And that's kind of well, can't I buy it? Can't can't you sell me a club that'll do it for me? It depends on what sort of person you are, and you know with how you go about learning and how you go about life in general. I think if you're looking for the difficulty in everything, well, guess what? It's going to be hard. Whereas if you go into it thinking, well, this isn't too difficult. It's quite simple. And have that sort of a childlike mindset, as you said before. You know, all twelve-year-olds are great putters. It's when they start missing a few when they're in their early 20s or 30s and people start telling them how hard it is, that's when they become poor putters because they've forgotten to putt like a kid. Didn't Vijay Singh talk about that? He'd read for too many years how bad a putter he was and he'd started to believe it. Mm. So he stopped reading about it and had an amazing season of playing extraordinary golf. Who are the best players that you've played with and the things that you've seen and what do you see when you watch professional golf that we recreational players (laughs) don't? Best players, oh, you know, I've seen a variety of, you know, swings and temperaments and I guess you know, the way people play. Up As far as swing goes, I mean, it's hard to go past an Adam Scott or I love playing with Louis Oosthuizen. Oh. You know, his swing just looks effortless. My favorite, Does it rub off? Oh, for sure. My favourite guy was Ernie Els. I love playing with Ernie because that rhythm just – it was like butter and you could just sort of, you know, almost – you're in copy mode, basically, and, and all, um, the worst score I ever shot playing with any might have been four or five under. I, wow. I loved it. No, I wish I could pack him up and put him <laughs> in my suitcase. <laughs> a, be a big suitcase. Be a big suitcase, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, they're the sorts of players, you know, obviously Tiger would have to go down as probably the best player I've ever played with and against um, just for the, not the things be- he could do. But not the beautiful swing like Els or Scott, is it? I mean, it, it's a little bit more violent. He had, he, yeah. His three-quarter swing is a gorgeous thing to watch. Mm. He plays some of those, but you watch him with the driver and those things. It's not that same no. smooth and, action, is it? Yeah, and maybe when I like, I played him in the match play a couple of times, he had periods where he played really well and other periods where he played pretty ordinary during those matches, so I got to see a bit of both, but I was just grateful he wasn't on top of his game <laughs> completely. Um but yeah, when he plays within himself and those three quarter shots, mm. as you say, or around the greens and on the mm. on the on the greens, it's it's an amazing. And I just his I love watching him from a mental standpoint and how focused he is over every shot. On the greens, Ben Crenshaw and Brad Faxon are the two of the best I've ever seen and, and played with. I've been fortunate to play with both, and it's it's like with those guys, you're watching uh, an artist at work. It's like watching you know what it might have been like to watch Picasso or you know. Um, Renoir or whoever, um, who's the guy who painted the Sistine Chapel, uh, Michelangelo. You know, it's. Why did you answer that? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I live with an artist, so I should know. Yeah, that's thing. right. Yes, but and that's the thing with I think great putters is all the best putters are artists. They're not scientists. You're not going to science the the green. You're going to you're going to artistically. Although Carsten, who's mm-hmm. yes, made the true. long, <laughs> he yeah. was the science. He was the ultimate science. Right? Yeah, he, I guess. I guess is the game art or science? I but, suppose. Is yeah. the question. I'm glad they've taken away the green reading books and. And I wish they'd take away the lines on the ball so you couldn't line the yeah, ball it's up. I'd never have given that a thought, but mm. same with Mark Allen was talking about it today. Well, it's an alignment uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. aid, isn't it? And then all of a sudden, well, people won't know where they're lining up. Oh, what do you do then? Well, I've got to feel as though I've got to put a good stroke on it and start it on the line I want and things like that. So that's a whole other conversation. Um, from a competitive standpoint, I always enjoyed playing with those players that they – didn't look the most talented, but geez, they got the most out of it. Like a Jim Furyk. I mean, he was incredible to watch him go about how uh, how he went about his game. Bernard Langer. I mean, he's it's still he's still going, and he's you know. And, and I always kind of wonder, geez, maybe they just don't want to go home. They just keep practicing all the time and grinding it out. And they're on tour. They don't want to enjoy life. But maybe that's what gives them their enjoyment. They love to compete and. And hey, I still love to compete, but I, I'm, I'm over the fact that you got to put all the hours in and do all that stuff. Do you have with to? It. Bruce Litsky didn't. Mm, yeah, but that's an anomaly. Um, you know, Bubba Watson's probably one where I never really saw him on the range. I always saw him out playing golf. But yeah, Laura Davies is another. Laura Davies, yeah, but they're one in the how many million? You know, you for the majority, you got to put. There's no substitute for hard work. That's for sure. 
So uh, If it's the right hard work would be the thing. I, if I go and practice my swing for four and a half hours a day, I'm going to perfect my swing, and that's not going to do anybody any good, is it? <laughs> well, not, not unless you've got the right instruction and, and you're trying to get better that day, right? Yeah, so. that's, uh, that's exactly right. The book's called Play Your Best Golf, Yes, and the emphasis is on the your, I suspect. Yes, how to play your best golf, basically. And, and the, as I said before, everyone is different. Everyone has their own mm. swing, their own style. There's a chapter in there called Play to Like Your Personality. I think that's a big thing on the golf course is to play how you would, you know, do things in everyday life. If you're an upbeat, hyperactive kind of person, well, don't try and slow down. You know, it's an interesting peek into the soul. Golf, you would have played a lot of pro-ams and seen people who are otherwise apparently cool, calm and collected really lose their stuff. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. Now, I I remember playing with this, this one pro-am um, with a businessman in the US. It was, might have been at Pebble Beach or somewhere like that. And he was a CEO of this big company and he was sweating on the first tee and it wasn't, it was cold. It was a cold day and he was sweating. And I walked over and I says, are you okay, mate? He goes, oh, I feel so nervous. This is just so out of my comfort zone. And I said, put an arm around his shoulder. I said, don't worry, we're going to have a bit of fun. And all these people, they really don't care who you, how you play. And to be honest, I don't care either. So <laughs> You're let's not just going have, to impress me, so don't worry about that. <laughs> let's just have a fun day and, and, and play as though you're playing with your mates, you know, and just enjoy yourself out here. And, and that's the real key, I think, for a lot of golfers out there is to adapt their own style, figure out what works for them. I'm not there in the book. I'm not telling people, in a sense, you know, how to play golf, uh, how I would play it. Uh, I offer suggestions on some of the things you can do. And the art of, I think, being a good coach is putting all these suggestions in front of people and then they can go, that works for me. Yes, I'll take that on board. No, I'm not going to leave that one. I'm going to leave that alone. That was what I did with Neil Simpson when I was early on in my career when he was giving me lessons. He'd tell me the same thing four or five different ways. One of them I'd relate to and the others I'd go, mm. but looking back, he, he knew that. He just figured out that he had to tell me different ways so that I could attach to one of them and, and then make it my own, basically. Yeah. Do you do much reflection, Nick? You're a cultured man. You like wine and your wife's an artist, as you say, and there's a whole bunch of other interests for Nick Ahern. Golf's obviously played an enormous part mm. in your life and it clearly still stimulates you intellectually and you still love to play and compete and whatnot. Do you have much time for reflection? And when you do look back, what do you make of your own career? What do you? Well, I've had to reflect a bit when writing the books, funnily enough, because you know I've sort of uh, been going, okay, what can I write about here and there? So I've had to delve back into the memory bank, so to speak, and my memory isn't that great, to be honest. So, <laughs> <laughs> what do I miss? It's it's funny. We were watching uh, what was the tournament on the European Tour last week, the Belfry, mm-hmm. and I was sitting there watching watching it in the morning with my wife and. She goes, oh, I miss those days, you know, because she actually caddied for me at the Belfry uh, one of the years. And I said, I do too. Yeah. I said, you know what I miss? I miss the locker room. I actually miss going in there and, you know, putting the shoes on, the sunscreen, although not so much in England, uh, putting the new glove on, smelling the glove and, and just sort of the banter in the locker room and things like that. You miss all those smaller moments, I guess. Is it a congenial place, the tour? Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, most of the guys get on really well. There are Obviously, there are, mm. you know, there are idiots out there and... Every environment you go into, whether it be sport or business, there's idiots everywhere. Um, and you can probably tell who they are out on tour by watching on TV because yeah, it's pretty much typically uh, the ones that you think are. are. But, um, you know, it's, that's their way of, of playing the game to the best of their ability. It's not that the fact that they're trying to put people off. It's just that the way that they get the most out of themselves is a different style to everyone else. And who's to say what's, what, what's right and what's wrong? couple of things to finish up because I just noticed how much of your time I've taken and I didn't mean to. You got to 16 in the world at that time. Did it feel like there were only 15 people on the planet better at golf than you? Because that's what the numbers said. That's what the numbers said. And when I said in, when I got to there, I thought, well, yep, 15 more to go. But did I realistically think I was the 16th best? I don't know. At the time, I probably didn't think much about it. And looking back, I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. That's a hell of an achievement, Nick. Um, that's a hell of an achievement. It, it, it was, yeah. And and I think the, the thing I'm probably more proud of is is I had a period of maybe five or six years, I don't know how many it was, in the end of, of being top 50. Because if you can get that top 50 world mm. rankings, that's when you get to pick and choose your schedule. It's and public service of golf, isn't it? It's, well, it's a free ride if you can stay there, which is not can, a free ride in itself. Yeah. But if you can stay there, you would get to pick and choose exactly yeah. what you want to do. Exactly. No, you, and for a couple of years, I got to play both tours, the European and PGA Tour, because I was in that top 50. If I wasn't, I couldn't have done that. Um, and then eventually I just sort of um, emigrated, I guess you'd say, over to the PGA Tour and stayed there for a number of years. So... 
it was uh, it was a fun journey while I was there, and hey, I wish I was there for more years. But um, that's the nature of golf; it, it changes, and and injuries come along, or other things in life that happen that you the can't knee control. Your knee surgery. The knees kind of kept me out for a while, yeah. And and when I came back from, oh, I've had about six surgeries on my right knee. When wow. I came back from the last one, I just thought, well, I'll just jump back on the horse because that was a major, major surgery, major reconstruction. And I got back playing. I thought, oh, hang on, this isn't as easy or as as I thought it was, you know, I thought I'd get back sooner and, and that was a real grind to get back after. And then I was probably never the same golfer after that either. So, but, um, you know, life changes and things move on and I'm happy being where I am now. Yeah, indeed. Well, you're back living in Melbourne and exactly. coffee's better than Florida for oh, sure yeah. and the golf courses are pretty <laughs> good as well. Last thing, to, if we took Nick O'Hearn's head and put it on, take your pick, any of the young guys you work with, Jordan Zunick or Minwoo Lee, you know, Cameron Smith, what sort of golfer would you have? Oh, I'd love to have their power. Um, that's for sure. Um, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. If you have their power, do you develop the skills that you did? I wonder, though. Well, that's that's the, uh, I guess the, the question, isn't it? It's a Sixty-four and, million dollar yeah. question in this day and age. <laughs> it's a lot of money in this day and age. But I think most of the players out there have a pretty good head on their shoulders. You're not you're not on tour if you don't have a good head on your shoulders. That's for sure. Now, what level of tour and where you are, that's a whole other story. Um, I know when I played, there were certainly a lot more physically talented players out there than, than me, but I knew mentally I was I was much better than them. Um, and I think that probably counted for more than the physical astro- attributes. That's why I love playing US Open so much, because I knew at the start of the week, half of these guys aren't even going to be my competitors, because I know they're not they're not going to last the distance. <laughs> at the same conversation this morning with Dennis McDade, we interviewed him for this very podcast, I remember speaking to Bob Rotella, I think it might have been in 03, when Jim Furyk won the week before the US Open, I said, realistically, how many guys have got a chance to win? And he said, 10, maybe 15, because they're the only people who believe they can win truly. Mm-hmm. That's a big thing to have in the back pocket is you can have all the physical skill in the world, but... Yeah, that, and that's... Yeah, it's like at the Masters, I think, each mm-hmm. year, because it's such a limited field. You, you go, okay, who has the... You kind of has it say it. Who has the balls and the mentality to to win on that back nine on a Sunday when it really, really matters? Mathematically, it's the easiest tournament in the world to win until you stand on the tenth tee Sunday afternoon with a chance to do it. <laughs> it all changes, doesn't it? That is exactly it right. Yeah. Nick, it's been fabulous to talk to you. Uh, fabulous! Congratulations on a second book. I couldn't write a book after write a column <laughs> every week. I find that hard enough. That's fantastic. Uh, I'm sure lots of people will buy it. They should and get lots out of it. But it's been terrific to have a little look back on your career today. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks, Rob. Very enjoyable. Well, I've got to say that if you didn't learn something in all of that that can help your game, I humbly suggest that you weren't listening properly. One of the game's genuine good guys is Nick. And again, do yourself a favour and buy both of his books. The latest one, Play Your Best Golf, is a ripper. That's it for episode 66 of the show, but make sure you've added us to the follow list on your preferred podcast app because on our next, John Huggan catches up with one of the best players in history not to have won a major. What would be the one that you'll look back on, though? And think? Probably the open at Turnbury. Um, I played well all week, and the, and I thought I've been thinking well all week, and I just got out of being in the moment, being in the present. And I looked back and I thought, oh, well, Tom's going to make par from there. I need I need to make this, and I charged the eight foot past the Mystic coming back and missed out on the playoff. So, and the other one would be Torrey Pines in. Uh, when Tiger won. When Tiger won. Um, you know, people I'd, forget you were playing with Tiger, wouldn't yeah, you? Yeah, I, I was one out of the playoff. You know, yeah. I was on the final green when he all that put. So, uh, um, yeah, I, f- I feel like I could have, I, sh- I probably should have won that US Open. That's Lee Westwood next time on The Thing About Golf.